I think all of this must have happened around the 1950s, 60s. Um, but um, after this is for like 10, 20 years is the kind of dark period for the quark model. Because initially with this success, it looks so promising. Um, so what, what would you do next if you really bought into this idea of quarks? That is this uh, fractional charge of one third or two thirds e. Like, what would you do next? You could find the mass of the quark, but what would you need to do before you can find the mass of the quark? You need to find the quark. You need to first isolate them, right? So people were now looking for free quarks. And free quarks would be something very easy to identify because it's the only particle we know that would have any kind of fractional charge. But uh, what I will tell you is that free quark has never been found. So when you look at the literature of the time from the 60s, 70s, or even through 80s, you are going to look, see the phrase parton. And um, parton is associated with constituent parts of neutrons and protons. Because people did a deep scattering experiment with the neutrons and protons, got experimental data that indicated that um, the scattering result you get, uh, kind of like with the rotor for the scattering, but high enough energy that you can actually go inside the proton. The scattering result you get is more consistent with the three scattering centers instead of just the one. But uh, when they were doing the experiment, they didn't give um, name quark to those particles they were seeing. They instead called it parton. And what it is indicating is a level of um, discomfort with the idea of quark because no one's been able to find the one. And um, like, what's happening here? And um, so, I guess I can tell you what hasn't changed. No one has still found uh, free quark. Instead, we have um, what's called, um, you can call it by different names. Uh, let me give you this phrase that you can search around and read up on your own. It's called quark confinement problem, or whatever, or color confinement. And um, you can think of this like a dark matter. Um, except I think it's better understood than dark matter. It's a name we have given to a phenomenon that we don't fully understand. But this idea of color confinement or quark confinement has been used to explain why we would never find free quark. And um, because as you try to separate quarks, there's so much more energy involved in it that you would produce a new pair of, uh, new pair of the quark anti quark pair. And that actually represents a meson or something um, that's associated with something called asymptotic freedom. You can read more about it on your own. Um, but what I'm fessing up right now is that no one has seen free quark. But the reason people have come to believe in the idea of quark model is associated with something called um, November Revolution. And I guess in the interest of time, I'll just tell you what they discovered instead of um, going through the whole process of how they discovered it. Um, so let me arrange my particles this way. So I kind of started out with uh, leptons this way, electron, one, and neutrino, electron neutrino, one family of lepton, muon, and muon neutrino, another family of lepton. Um, but with the mesons and baryons, I did this complicated listing of things. And you know, I, in hindsight, this is all mistake because I'm trying to list the elementary particles and the evidence is that mesons and baryons are not elementary. They are made up of other particles. So let's just, uh, for the moment, let's pretend that quarks are actually elementary. So, all right, let's list the quarks. Um, so if you believe in the idea of quarks, then um, so there is an up quark that has, um, oh, I think I did it in the wrong order. That's fine. I have up quark and down quark. 
And each of these particles, there are properties you can associate with them, which is kind of um, how they are arranged. So they are all um, known elementary, uh, uh, let me call this elementary fermions. Everything under this um, heading is a spin half particle. Um, and once you start organizing them, then they kind of get organized by charge. So these all have charge of minus one, and it's the particle version does. Um, these all have charge of um, charge of uh, zero. So it's more positive than these particles. Um, I want to organize them the same way. Oh, so the way I should have organized them is actually this way. Um, so the more negative particles are here, so I would organize them this way. Down quark and up quark. Um, so this is the first kinds of quark that we know about. Still spin half, fermion. And I guess the quarks that fall under this column here is going to have charge of minus one third E. And quarks that fall under this category is going to have charge of plus two thirds E. So with the discovery of uh, strangeness or you know, with the strange particles, the additional thing you have introduced is the strange quark, which has charge of minus one third E. So strange quark would fit here, strange quark. Do you see anything missing here? Any obvious blank space that ought to be filled? Because otherwise it's aesthetically displeasing. <laughs> They're like, this represents a new kind of family or generation of quark, right? So there must be something else that's paired with it. So this is the quark that we today give the name of charm quark. So you could call this the prediction of the quark model, that if quarks are a real thing, so we have this third quark, but you can just stop with the third quark because quarks come in pairs. So if we have strange quark, there must also be a charm quark. So the event I call November Revolution is the discovery of the bound charm quark state. The discovery of the uh, charm, anti-charm quark state that's today known as J slash slash psi particle. So one of those particles that, one of the, I think, only particle that has two names because of simultaneous discovery. Um, so two different groups, one called it J, the other called it psi resonance and the discoveries were close enough that they both deserved equal credit. So, um, so that's what the particle is called now, J slash psi. Who knows why it's not called psi slash J. And it's a bound state of charm, anti-charm quark state. And that's a kind of, and this validated the quark model enough for the particle physicists that even though we still haven't found free quarks, this is enough for people to say, we believe in this. Um, we don't, you can't say quark, but we believe it's underneath everything because it uh, explains enough. Um, so, so we are, I think, into 1970s, eight, no, not probably 1970s. Um, I think this actually happened in the late 1960s. Um, if you want to get the correct date, read it through this note, because when I was writing up the note, I actually researched what I was writing and I was sure to put down the correct date. <laughs> but I, I'm not a good historian, I can't actually remember the actual date. So um, within this note, um, there's a place where I talk about the November Revolution. Uh, wait, wait. Uh, November Revolution, so mid 1970s. <laughs> That's when they, uh, when those discoveries came about. And um, this is the plot that uh, explains the what they discovered. Um, this is an energy plot of the. This is the energy plot of what they were measuring. They were measuring uh, interaction cross section, or how quickly does uh, um, 
how quickly does a new particle be, get produced? And there's a kind of underlying theory that says, you know, the higher energy you go, the lower the interaction cross-section, unless you form something interesting, like a bound state, some kind of resonance. That's what these peaks are. And um, this peak here, very sharp, very narrow peak, that, associate, that, that is associated with the J psi particle is what they discovered. And it's a very sharp, very narrow peak because the charm quark, it's a new kind of quark. So apparently in addition to strangeness, there's one more quantity that now needs to be conserved. Now we need to conserve charmless or charm. So conservation of charm means now that, you know, to get rid of that charm requires um, another charm violating process that takes longer. That means longer lifetime. So from energy time uncertainty principle, which I never really covered in this class, <laughs> means um, these are more longer lived, become more longer lived particles. So, um, so just to skip to the end. Um, so at this point, we have two generations of leptons and quarks. And um, at some point, somebody discovers the third generation. I don't know which one comes first. So I'm pretty sure this upsilon is the bound state of the um, bottom, bound state of the uh, bottom and anti-bottom quark. So I'm trying to remember what got discovered the first. This upsilon, a uh, new meson state, or the tau lepton. But whichever one came first, <laughs> somebody discovers new generation of particle. For our purposes, let's pretend that they found the upsilon uh, first. So to explain this resonance here, new resonance, um, they come up with a new quark that now has a different quantity associated with it that has to be conserved. A B or the bottomness or beauty. I don't know. I think bottom is the most common way. So the bottom quark continues to fit here. So now you have a bottom quark here. And it's like seeing a tip of the iceberg. That means there has to be more underneath. So having a one quark in the third generation means there must be the other quark. So there's the, so they go look, looking for it, and top quark is I think it was the last of the particles to be discovered because it's the heaviest of the quarks, um, and in fact the top quark is so heavy, so unstable that I don't think they've ever found the bound state of top and anti-top. That's never been found. I don't think it actually forms. And once you have third generation of quark, then you would begin to wonder, hey, three generations, two generations, that doesn't really match. So that probably means there's a third generation of leptons. And, um, and so for the purpose of this discussion, let's pretend that that's what actually happened. Then someone goes looking for the third generation of uh, leptons, and they find it. And that lepton is called tau lepton. And uh, we assume there's a neutrino associated with it. We call that tau neutrino. So these are the 12 elementary fermions that we know. Three generations of leptons consisting of six elementary particles and three generations of quarks consisting of six <laughs> elementary quarks. Um, I guess uh, that's where we will, so that's the introduction to quarks and leptons. 